Thanks everybody for watching. We got a special guest here on Poe Outdoors today, Troy Fowler, AKA the Ranch Fairy. You might be familiar with him if you are a bow hunter. And if you're not, I encourage you to stick around, watch this video. It's gonna be packed full of information from Troy. So Troy, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, sure, thank you. All right, and then we're just gonna talk all things arrows, FOC, uh, broadheads, you name it. We're gonna kind of turn Troy loose. You might have some questions, a little show and tell. But okay. I think it's going to be an entertaining, fun time. Before we get rolling, though, let's do this. Let's preface this video by saying arrow weight or broadhead size is not the only thing that matters. We just want to make sure everybody out there understands there are more important things that lead up to that that have to be right. And so let's get started with that, Troy. If you'll go over that, the foundation of how you can build a heavy arrow, good FOC, et cetera, that'll be a great starting point. So okay. have at it. Thanks, thanks again for having me. So um, if you're new to this, or this is the first exposure to the Ranch Ferry and high forward to center arrows and adult broadheads and stuff, please just hang on because your mind is about to explode. Okay, so I'm totally counterculture. I'm all about effectiveness. I want wounding rates to go down. And the, I want you to understand that the, this, the, the place I come from is what happens at impact. We have to deliver the arrow from the bow to the animal, but nobody's talking about what happens at impact and the broad industry, and this is not a slam on the industry, it is rife with a lot of great target shooters and 3D guys and spot guys who are awesome. And I'll never be those people at delivering an arrow repeatedly over and over again from my bow to the target. So put this in your head, I worry about the second your broadhead hits something, what happens from that point forward. We're going to discuss delivering the arrow to the target, but we, we are only concerned about penetration and getting through the animal. And they're not, they are mutually exclusive topics. Mm. They are interlinked. But the fact that your arrow hits an animal does not mean it's going to work. So if you'll keep your head there, you won't turn this off. And if you don't, you're going to turn it off and that's okay. Unsubscribe from my channel or whatever. So <laughs> um, the high forward to center world, it, it came from a study by Dr. Ed Ashby. He has 12 penetration enhancing factors that he identified for the Natal, it's called the Natal study in Africa. He will never say this, but that study opened up the continent. Hmm. When that study started, in the 80s, three countries were open to bow hunting because they had no ways or means laws, <clears throat> which means you could shoot them with cannons, muzzle loaders, throw spears at everything. They didn't care how you got your critters. And the other countries were closed to bow hunting. And that study was done by the African Game Board through Ed to study what works. Awesome. And it opened the whole continent. Mm. He will never talk about that. Hmm. he's one of the most humble people i spent the whole day with him yesterday his oh god it's like a museum of archery we went in all his shipping containers and stuff we won't get sidetracked on that so let's get back on topic um there's a couple of things you need to achieve before you worry about your arrow mass the first thing is the rule number one of dr ed's is structural integrity your arrow can't bend your air your broadheads can't break the edge cannot erode on impact because the steel is goo. And that's a problem. Yeah. Stuff needs to be sharp. Your inserts can't explode. The arrow can't snap. And again, this is an impact. The second part of this is perfect arrow flight. I am a bear shaft guy. I have not been able to beat cutting the fletchings off your arrows and shooting them through paper and figuring out how to make them fly straight. If you can get an arrow at seven yards is all you need to do to shoot through paper. When you fletch it, it's gonna be awesome. Mm -hmm. But if it's tearing that wide and then you fletch it and, it's, and you shoot through paper and it shoots perfect, it's not shooting perfect. Mm -hmm. It's still coming off. Wow, there's an adult broadhead right there. <laughs> um, your arrow, when you have a fletched arrow, that's bare shaft tearing this wide is still coming off the bow like this, but the fletchings are so overwhelming. It lies to you 
and corrects. But when you put that on the front, that's a wing, okay? I have a few broadheads that I have experimented with, okay? It's not like I don't have every dadgum thing on earth. And all of them create aerodynamic lift. They are not a field point. A field point is a liar. They are aerodynamic. Right. And these babies have lift. They're just, they have surfaces. I don't care if it's four blade. I don't care if it's a mechanical. I don't care. They are not as aerodynamic as a field point. Mm -hmm. So when you have the arrow come off, you think it's good because your paper tunes with fletched arrows is good. It's still going like this and then wiggling and then correcting in a very short space, but it's still wiggling. And this thing will catch the air. So this is when people say, hey, broadheads don't fly. My broadheads don't fly. Brand X doesn't fly. No, it's the stick. <laughs> the arrow doesn't <laughs> Not fly. Flying. Yeah. And then this thing is biting into the atmosphere, whatever orientation it is, four blade, three blade, I'm not really worried about that. I've shot all this stuff out to 100. The furthest I've launched, I've shot 750, 100 yards. Hmm. And it, but the arrow's tuned. But this thing right here, the atmosphere has weight. It's going to get a little pointy hat. Hang in there. The atmosphere is actually pushing down on Earth, and at sea level, it's 14.7 PSI. You're shooting through something that has mass. Right. So this is basically cutting through really thin jello the whole time. Okay? So when you shoot a crappy arrow that's not really well-tuned, and it comes off a little like that, See that? You see that flat? It's biting into the atmosphere. And then it tries to correct and tries to correct. And you say your broadheads don't fly. Well, yeah, because <laughs> it's going like that all the way to the target. We would prefer something more on that line. Right. And that is a humongous deal. Um, flesh paper tuning is fine, but I prefer the bear shaft part. And if you can get a really structurally sound broadhead that won't explode, and I'm not a mechanical guy. So if you're a mechanical guy, and that's your deal. And that makes you mad. See ya. <laughs> they just, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And they're really wide and they're super inefficient um, on impact. So um, if you can get that bear shaft flying, you brought his fly. Those are the first two things you've got to, you've got to achieve okay. before you worry about all those arrow mass stuff. And so before you go into more of Ashby's <clears throat> points, I want to ask, I... I, uh, prior to this past hunting season, I yes, used uh, mechanical for yep. every deer I ever shot. And for yep. me, you know, every deer I had shot with mechanical died within a hundred yards of impact, which is- Did great. you hit anything hard? <laughs> exactly. So I made the leap from mechanical to fixed, yep. Yep. not because of a bad past experience, but because of a bad future potential experience. Mm -hmm. And so for okay. me, I thought, I don't want my aero system to do any gymnastics from it leaving my rest to nope. it hitting a deer's body. And so that was a big, a big reason why I made the leap. And then the second reason was I was listening to, I think it was the guy who heads up the United Trackers in, in, in America where he, he tracks deer with dogs. He's been on like- Those well, guys, I've talked to them. Yeah. And so there- when It's he a said, disaster. Yeah. When he said, anytime we have a deer that looks to be hit well, but it ends up being a flesh wound or you don't get rib, rib cage penetration- he said, every single time it's with me. So yep. for me, that's what caused me to make the leap. So my question would be, why is it that so many people struggle to make that leap from mechanical to fixed? Uh, the general industry says the, that fixed blade broadheads don't fly. Got it. And I'm not really a conspiracy theorist. If you're selling mechanical, mechanical broadheads are really efficient in the air. I shot them for 10 years. It's not like I haven't done this. I'm 52 years old. I shot a bow since I was 12. Mm -hmm. Back when we shot 21.17s and 145 grain bare razor heads, because that's all we had. Yep. And my bow was going to whipping 220. <laughs> that's exactly We right. lost arrows all the time because they went through the deer and skipped yep. off in the woods and we didn't know any better. It wasn't even a question. Right, there might've been some nocturnal hunting. <laughs> you know statute of limitations and all that uh, but we would have we'd shoot deer and they'd run 40 yards and fall over and the arrows were gone or there we didn't leave arrows and animals we just didn't know any better 
We didn't have anything else. Shooting 600 grains, that's what you had. So you just opened your pin gaps and said, call it good, right? How has your performance been with fixed? Did you lose anything? Did you have any struggles? Did they not blood trail? I mean, did you know, what's well, the comparative analysis limited, for you? With the limited experience I have with fixed, uh, when I've hit a deer where they should be hit, blood trail is fantastic. Pass through is no problem. And yeah. I think there's also this idea that if you use a fixed, your blood trail is not going to be good, which yeah. according to Ashby, I read that nine page paper or whatever on the key factors in an arrow system. Penetration is the most important thing. If you can get right. two holes in an animal and drain blood out the bottom, that's fantastic. So my experience was my blood trail with fixed was just as good as mechanical, but more mm -hmm. importantly, I, I was getting passed through. So for me, right. it's, I'll never go back. So the, there's a missed, there's a missed point in that. Everything you said is correct, but I have a I'm a respiratory therapist uh, and uh, I was fortunate at our school. We had a very vibrant physical therapy department to the point they had funding for cadavers, mm. which is very rare in any of those. You know, I'm basically an RN. And rarely do you have cadavers, but I got lucky. I mean, I didn't plan it that way. It just freaking happened. So because they didn't need the internal organs, I got to work on humans. Mm. So the one thing that, that is not being discussed is just overlooked because people don't know anything about physiology. It's not of their, it's a small subset of us nerds who think this stuff's interesting. <laughs> but let's take a quartering away shot. And I did a video called uh, Nervous Ned String Jump. I'm, I haven't had an animal stand still on video yet. So that's another problem we got to overcome. Yeah. We will never overcome it except for hitting them with a howitzer. Mm. That, that aside. So this pig was, he was annoying. For, he was only like 100 pounds, but he busted a bunch of us and winded us and was going way around and stuff. Come on, just walk in there. <laughs> Be a good sport. So I said, I'm killing Ned. He's got to go. He's too smart. <laughs> and I don't usually shoot the small ones, but he deserved it. So this pig uh, was a little quarter in. And when the arrow launches, you, the arrow's going right at his armpit. And by the time it hit him, well, he was about, let's just say this is his head. He, it hit him. <clears throat> Uh, from the camera angle I, it started going here he went like that and it hit him in the guts okay mm -hmm. the arrow penetrated 22 inches broke his spine and exited and went through his ear wow i had the fletch out one side and the broad head out the other because he was rotating and it broke his spine um he caught it and he went down right mm -hmm. i don't like tracking anyway so flipping <laughs> them over is way cooler had that aside I actually measured the penetration channel and it was 22 inches of penetration, hole to hole, right? I'm not counting the shaft through, it doesn't matter. Once the broadhead's out, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's hole to hole, right? And at um, 16 was, uh, no, at nine, it hit the liver. And then beyond that was the lungs and broke his back. Mm -hmm. So if I'm shooting a substandard arrow, and it only goes in a foot. Mm -hmm. It penetrates the liver, the guts seal the hole. It barely gets through the diaphragm, scratches around on his lungs and he's gone. Mm. I promise you, he's not dying. You're not gonna have a blood trail. There's no chance, it went right through his stomach. Mm -hmm. That's a bunch of hay and food. It's gonna cork up, the shaft's in him. Mm -hmm. And if it, he's gonna die, <clears throat> you're just not gonna find him. Right. You're gonna end up stumbling on him, not know it, he's gonna run off. You'll never find them. Right. And because that arrow over penetrated, which is a very interesting thing the mechanical guys say, is you need to use all the energy and just hit him in the other side of the chest wall. Yeah. BS. It's not a gun. It's not a bullet. It's yeah, right. We're not shooting, we're not getting cavitation. Right. You know, come on. So if that arrow hadn't advanced, let's say it only advanced liver and stopped in the spine. I had a wound this long in the lung. So that's a much more uh, lethal hit, still may not have found him, but he's less likely to run as far. I broke his back. That's what the mechanical guys who say this, you know, let's expend all the energy. You're wasting energy shooting through stuff. I had enough energy to break his spine and two, two vertebrae were snapped wow. and it went out his neck and it went up through his ear. That's what you want. You want that. Yeah hitting his spine was great mm -hmm. he rotates like this 
And then he goes, walk. <laughs> yeah. Cut his aorta. And he was he was dead in like 10 seconds. Because nice. it severed the aorta right under the spine. So there that's why we want to overpenetrate. You want as many organs damaged because you do not get cavitation. You don't get any of the wound channel expansion from velocity. Right. And for all you clowns out there, it's been heavily studied. It's about 2,400 feet per second before that happens. Just saying. So you guys shooting 800 yards, good luck getting your bow to do that. Yeah. I mean, your, your bullets to do that. But um, <clears throat> the that is the key. And yeah. that's why we want to over penetrate, right? Right. You do not want to leave an arrow on an animal. And, and as hunters, I mean, we're not out there to shoot. We're out there to kill. That's, that's what we're doing is trying to harvest as, as, as uh, you know, as clean and ethical as we possibly can. And what's wrong with an animal going down in sight? I've, I've always uh, appreciated that. Yeah, it's way better. It's, yeah. I've never been able to control a blood trail. I mean, I've taken document, I've written down blood, you know, stuff. And the, the better, the, the more structurally sound broadheads I can get and the sharper and I've really learned to sharpen this year, in the last two years and strop and get them just, I mean, take them and you cut tissue paper and there's no sound. Hmm. It just, it doesn't hiss, just goes, Oop, and there's no noise. And when you do that, the level of cut within the internal organs is hmm. exponential because you're cutting everything. You're not just cutting big stuff or stuff that's kind of rough and gets hung up on it and pops up, pops across it. It will just slice through everything. I, my new goal as of a couple of years ago is to kill them as fast as possible. And if I get a blood trail, great. Yeah. And that's, it's just, a, it's a completely different mentality. Right. To shoot a arrow that will shoot through the front part of the animal low, possibly encounter shoulder blade where all the major vessels are and have them go nowhere. To heck with blood trailing. Kill the stupid thing. Right. Because yeah. you'll never control it. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that too. I late December, um, <clears throat> we were really fortunate. We purchased some land this year and, and in years past the property, the property that we'd had, it held good bucks and we've killed some good ones, but the property we have now, uh, you know, we're passing deer that we would have shot in years past <laughs> and which great? is a nice so thing. It's a, ni it's a nice thing. I've got some on video. Good problem to have. Oh yeah, it is. And so <clears throat> we passed some deer opportunities missed I shouldn't say missed this year but late season I went ahead and took a doe and I have a confession to make it was with a rage oh, broadhead Come on, <laughs> it was. I've used rage for a long time but I committed to changing after this year but I said you know what I don't want to mid-season I wasn't going to make the change so no, I figured let's, let's yeah. see how it goes and then I've already as soon as season was over started testing shooting fixed I told you the VPAs mm -hmm. we're working with and yeah working with that company and so yep. but when you say that about a blood trail I, I hit this doe at 29 yards I aimed for the shoulder not the crease right in the shoulder towards both lungs but I didn't even exit the opposite shoulder from 29 right. yards she goes about 80 first 40 45 yards zero blood yeah, right. Your blood full of it in the chest cavity. Now, if that would have been in a really thick environment early season, and it would have been a really good buck, as my, you may have been concerned, where's my blood? You're panicking, and you can lose deer that way by was the relying tree on the blood trail. What's that? Were you on the ground or was it out of a tree? Elevated. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. So it was disappointing, but it, it, uh, I actually told Mitch from, from VPA, I went over after I shot that deer to Fort Wayne to pick up some test heads and I told him what happened. I said, it's just a testament to, to us being ready to move full time to these fixed heads. I just shot a doe, not an adult buck, five and a half year old mature bone structure. It was a doe. Correct. And I, That's a I didn't get a pass through. Animal, by the way. I didn't get a pass through on a doe and she was a good one, yeah. but yep, yep. still. So I uh, definitely making a switch. No doubt. <laughs> it's good that she only went 80, right? So yeah. back to your you know, I did a, a quarter and two shot series with the hunting public videos and they had trouble finding a few, just, it's a, it's a location of the organs thing. And everybody shoots way too far back on that shot because they're yeah. scared of hitting bones and they should just shouldn't shoot because yeah. it's going to be a gut shot. It's in, it's almost guaranteed to be a gut shot. If you shoot them behind the crease quarter and two, it's just exiting in the guts. Yeah. But, um, your 80 yard tracking job, any idiot can find them. Yeah. Even in a tough, you're going to see them run. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I don't know many people who shoot and they've gone. 
I mean, oh, there's some guys in Florida and stuff who hunt the palmettos and they just have little bitty shooting windows. They shoot them and they just hear them running. Right. But most of us get, you know, a line of sight. So you can usually advance and cut that down in half and then start circling from there. So that's, it's a testament that you shot forward, right? Mm -hmm. If you shot her further back, she'd have gone, she could have gone another 50 or 60 and made it worse. Right. And especially for the early seasons, green grass, oh, yeah. chest high stuff. Mm -hmm. And I get a kick out of it. <laughs> I laugh a lot at videos. These people shoot deer in waist high grass. That's, that's, you know, swaying in the breeze. And they say, I just don't have a blood trail. Yeah, you know how much material is between you and that deer? Like 80 million, you know, microns per inch of stuff. How are you expecting to see it? Yeah. Eat snow, get some snow, that's good. You got tracks and all that. Run it across dirt. But I get a kick out of the early season guys who just say, I just probably had just didn't cause a blood trail. I'm thinking <laughs> because the blood, um, because the, uh, all the, plants are so many of them it's hard to it's hard to, to track it yeah you know yeah you know and, and nick here started kind of after i jumped on this and it's crazy because i'll be 50 this year so i'm, I'm almost as experienced as you uh yeah. but you know back in the day we shot i, I mentioned to you before we shot 22 13s 21 17s you know at 11 grains per inch we shot 125 130 uh grain broadheads they didn't have anything 54, else. 75 arrows and never even thought about it and the bows were at 220 230 uh the <laughs> let off was 50 percent if you're lucky yeah. they find the wheels were 16. like that big around and yeah exactly and pass-throughs were never even a question and for whatever reason I think it, it was kind of laziness on society's part when mechanicals came out and you throw it on and it flies just like your field point. We don't want to go back and tune broadheads and mess with it. Let's just put this on because it flies really well and it makes a big old giant hole. And so well, yeah, refreshing to okay. go back, back to my roots it, kind of. It all blended together with the carbons. Yeah. I mean, I remember when the carbon showed speed. up. Yeah. And then everybody started going fast and the bows were exploding and making all kinds of noise. And then they fixed the bows yep. and made them quieter shooting lighter stuff and then the arrows are flying insane but we're talking about a you know we're talking about four to center going down to aluminums are much easier to tune because they don't have a seam right they're literally a round tube mm -hmm. so they're not as picky about um tuning as a as a carbon is but um all these adjustments we made and you're shooting a very unstable object yeah mm -hmm. when they're things like eight or nine percent four to center it's just kind of it's literally doing this in the air. And then once I said the wing on the front, you got two wings and a big stick and there's nothing making it fly. Mm -hmm. So we just got a, we just met a guy named Daryl Barnett. He worked for the DOD for 30 years, designing ballistic rockets hmm. and high penetration projectiles, anti-tank and anti-reactive armor. And also into bunkers and stuff. And they actually found, well, the four to center thing is a fact from model, uh, model rockets and, and ballistic missiles and all that stuff. You can't miss by like half a mile with a ballistic missile, you know, right. <laughs> causes collateral damage and getting the news and all that. <laughs> they got to make sure those things hit where they're aiming. And yeah. then um, he said they actually found that um, a very heavy, slow projectile worked better in dense materials bunkers, sand, you know, concrete and, and reactive armor than a really fast object. And it comes down to physics. So the resistance equation doubles the amount of resistance, squares it hmm. for velocity. It's just math. Yeah, yeah. Once again, as you're shooting through the air, the arrow's eating itself alive, trying to press through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then when it hits something, it's trying to press through that. Mm -hmm. We are seeing the reports from Africa before COVID and all that crap. 65 pound bows are outperforming 80 on Cape Buffalo. Really? Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. Where they're getting more pass throughs. And we're talking about shooting 800 grain arrows. I mean, you gotta shoot adult arrows over there. That's a big animal. And there's a lot of bones in them and stuff. And they're kind of annoying, covered with mud. And they're kind of big, you know. Yeah. But the higher velocity projectile, same arrow weight, 
So we're not getting a thousand grain air on the 80 pound bow. They're shooting 750, 800. Mm. And the 65 pound bows are getting more pass throughs on Cape Buffalo than 80 is. Hmm. Why is that? Because, because of B squared. Okay. Gotcha. It's just the resistance equation sure. squares resistance for velocity. Mm. Now, there's a trade off there. Um, for there's an argument that you could go, you know, build you a 600 grain arrow and shoot an 80 pound bow so you flatten your trajectory. Mm-hmm. That goes without saying, right? Mm-hmm. Except for V squared. So one of my, one of my subscribers who's really a, a pointy hat guy, he's a 26 inch draw shooting about 65 pounds. And he's, he, 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 had, he put a chrono at 70. And a 500 grain arrow lost 14% speed 600 lost 11 and 650 lost 11.2 from the muzzle to the target okay his buddy arrow lost less energy lost less speed over distance right because of v squared it's not pushing on the atmosphere as hard that's what we're thinking so he got his buddy who's got a 29 inch draw shooting 415 grains and he lost 16 percent His muzzle was 305, and he lost 16% of his speed over 70 yards. Hmm. And that's, and he before, had no, that's before impact. That's, that's before impact. Fast. They were just shooting through a chrono. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. So he doesn't have any mass helping him once it gets there. Right. And everybody acts like, you know, heavy arrows go like this. Actually, they, <clears throat> they, they just turn into a kind of a nice parabola. I mean, they don't really dip off. I did at least under... I shoot 630 and 24% because that's the highest performance. And I like 200 gram broadheads for my bow. That just seems to be the right magic poop. You know, when you shoot 750, it shoots flat to about 30 yards and then you see it. And I think that's the bow getting overloaded. Yeah. I don't, I think the bow, when you shoot 750, I shot 1,035 is the most I've ever killed anything with just jacking around. Mm-hmm. And at about 800 grains, the bow pushes back. I bet. That makes it's sense. It's like, the, yeah, the transmission is not designed for the freaking engine. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and, and then correspondingly on the other side, there's got to be a bunch of lost energy when you shoot a really light arrow through a very high velocity tool. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. we're talking about, you know, put a 55 grain bullet in the 300 wind mag, right? Yeah. There's a whole lot of lost zinger there because that bullet doesn't weigh nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're, go- we're going to try to quantify that, actually. We're going to try to mathematically quantify the sweet spot for different bow systems because, like me, I shoot 65 pounds and I have a, a expedition that's a five-inch mm-hmm. brace. And those cams, I mean, they, when you, they really come over. And yeah. if you just so much as think about the sky, it wants to take off. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing wants to go. Yeah. And it's about 30 feet per second faster than my cure, my elite cure, which I love. It's just, my cure is just like, you know, just, you just shoot. It's freaking fantastic. And it just eats anything. They're not the same 65 pound bow. Right. But the spine charts tell us it is. That's, mm-hmm. I promise you it's not. Great point. Yeah. 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 It's, it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. So this year, um, we've really started experimenting quite a bit. And then this is Nick's arrow. And this is what, 577 grains? Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, perfect. You could always test even higher, but cut us a little break. We're just kind of testing. No, no, that's a, a really good. If you get over 550 and you're shooting a compound with a real arrow, with a real broadhead, you're you're exactly in, and the deer and, are in trouble bro they're in trouble and that's also with a with 150 grain point now we do have from vpa a 175 and a 200 grain that they're going to send us to test which will yeah. put you over 600 there mm-hmm. and so out of his matthews atlas this chronos at like 263 or something it generates ridiculous foot pounds and yep. momentum and so mm-hmm. that arrow and it flies nice i mean you think 262 or 263 is slow Back at 60 yards, it flies really nice. Oh, yeah. Really and nice. it's not going to stop. It's right. not going to stop. I mean, what you ought to do is reduce the insert weight and run the weight, run the broadhead up and shoot the same arrow. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Just cut the damn, cut the insert off Yep. Mm-hmm. and run the point weight up. And your four to center will go up. And the, Bubba, those 200 grainers are man size. And there's some steel on those things. 
I, I just, uh, these Spartan Black Eagle, I just put these together yesterday and we actually have a chronograph coming tomorrow to do more testing and play around with. Mm -hmm. I just put these ethics in. These are 50 grain aluminum and I really like them for the collar. Just provide a little integrity to the front of the carbon, but you can cut these down to 25. So right. I want to test these with say 100, 125, 150 and then cut them down and then throw 175, 200 as well. That's what I would do. Run the whole gamut of testing mm -hmm. with these things and see which ones fly the best. <clears throat> right. And then the, the one t thing you need to be careful of, what spine is that arrow? Those are 250s, all of them. Okay, you'll be fine. Yeah. So I was jacking around. Uh, Sirius came out with a micro. And a micro inherently in itself, just because it's micro, is lighter. And I've been wanting to get a 550, 24%, 25% unicorn arrow. Mm -hmm. High four to center and light, just to test it. Yeah. And I, so I shot 300s and I got them bear shaft with broad with uh, field points and they were, I was just like, Oh yes. You know, <sighs> and I went out to shoot broadheads and they just, I mean, hmm. they just were weird. They weren't doing loops when any banana rolls, they didn't, you know, go like that. They just got shoot and they, eh. and then, eh. you know, it was about this wide. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about my form and see possibly getting a duck and putting it on a bench so that I could get the right azimuth, you know, of the earth and wait for the moon to come up and all that stuff that people go through and all them gyrations, yeah. or I could just go grab the 250. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Right down the middle and I backed yeah. up to 60. And when I went, you know, you know, you know, when you give it the old winger and it goes left, that's you. Yeah. But when I did my job, it went right down the middle and that was a spine mm -hmm. issue. So for y'all that are farting around with this, be careful trying to max your FOC by dropping the spine. Do not compromise broadhead flight for four to center. Hmm. There's an old man named Dr. Ashby. And if you asked him that, he would say, duh. Yeah. It's got to hit where you aim it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was just praying that was going to work. I was just like, you know, um, on the micros, though, I'm not a fan. <laughs> the durability is not they're micro 204 rampage like you got in your hand or whatever mm -hmm. that's where it starts that's where it, i think that's the plum number yeah until they do something with the micros the outserts are narrower i'm bending them gotcha and i'm not happy i mean i'm not happy with the micro stuff yeah mm -hmm. somebody will figure it out right right they always right. do well i don't know if i have one doesn't matter um the uh the shaft itself is smaller than the broadhead this is a little bigger just imagine this is smaller right mm -hmm. so the end of the shaft is here and your broadhead sitting in the sleeve and this space is not connected and it's not inside the shaft like a 204 like you've got in your hand with the rampage or i shoot the serious apollos mm -hmm. And I believe there's some columnar support by the carbon being around the insert. But when it's sticking out on top of the shaft inside the sleeve up here, mm -hmm. I'm getting the sleeves are bending. Gotcha. I'm not bending broadheads and field points. Hmm. And that's a problem because as we discussed, I'm worried about what happens at impact. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's going to be a redirect. Mm -hmm. And where I shoot at stuff, there's going to be a redirect. <laughs> I, just, I don't like tracking. Just right. blow them over. So, so fun. expound upon that a little bit more. What you're talking about, I've heard you mention plan B many times. And, yep. and coming from the, the gun community, kind of, you know, we don't say carry concealed or protect our homes with the best intentions in mind. If, if things go bad is what we're preparing for. So you build arrows for that exact thing. So talk about that a little bit more. What does plan B mean in your arrow builds? Okay, that's a great question. So y'all have it been having plan A hits with your mechanicals and they work fine. Yep. That would be a hit in front of the diaphragm in the rib cage, you know, decent angle. No weird skippers, <clears throat> you know, your arrow's not banana in, and somehow your broadhead stays together and still goes to the other side of the animal and just hits the other side of the chest wall. So one of the things that I love about shot placement 
gurus and i'm gonna disrupt that here pretty soon Get, i'm gonna have a lot of hate mail on, the, on one of the on that video hey we will um, too that's fine a lot of the pros preach perfect shot placement okay well it gets cold bladder gets full yeah you know you walk to half a mile and you're swinging out of a tree and the deer doesn't exactly stand in front of you on a mowed field that the pros get to hunt on waiting for a broadside shot. I hunt over deer feeders and use my pigs as a test lab so I can get whatever angle I want. Right. I mean, it's a really cool ecosystem to test. Mm -hmm. But you guys are doing public stuff or whatever, tree swinging and all that. You don't get the shot angles. You have to shoot. Plan B is when you hit something that isn't perfect shot placement. Yeah. So when you read the message boards and all those people are snorting that, that other dust, not the fairy <laughs> dust, they're saying you're either a bad shot or you didn't hit where you're aiming and you need to tune your bow. Well, they duck and they roll, they spin, and there isn't an equation for the reaction speed of an animal anywhere on this earth. Right. Okay. I'm not very fast. Manute Bowl is fast. <laughs> NBA players who can flat, flat-footed dunk over somebody's head, got springs in their legs. I don't own. I can't even leave the earth. <laughs> Animals are the same way. And there's different ecosystems where there's there's some huge ranches in Texas that are you know quarter million acres mm -hmm. and over. Those deer don't get hunted. They'll just stand there and take it like a champ, right? So plan B is when you shoot properly and the game changes. Mm. Remember, the animal has a vote. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We so, don't control everything. And, and the along animal with the has a vote in the day that is currently undertaking. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, there's been a couple of videos of people trying to estimate drop. And they put out charts and all the stuff that's gravitational based on it's fine, but it's BS because they, they spin, they roll, they drop, they, they bounce ones. I've never had one jump up. So we know, <laughs> we know they're not going up. Mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest detriment to arrow penetration is the drop and roll. When they do this, it just sucks up the energy, changes all the angles, Right introduces bone you tree stand guys i don't do that a lot but 12 feet is about as high as we get at the ranch because i don't have trees we just can't go up but when you um are in a tree stand and your deer's broadside the shoulder blade let's say is right here you aim here you, you just introduce the shoulder blade the animal has a vote mm -hmm. yeah that's a plan b arrow everything works in plan a yeah I have killed a ton of stuff with mechanicals. I shot a black wildebeest in Africa with a rage, one of the original rages, the ones that popped out all the time and all that. I hit it right on top of the heart and blood shot out four feet. Hmm. It was unbelievable. Yeah, I should have taken the commercial. I yeah. mean, I should have taken some money and sent that video to him. It was amazing. I thought I'd found a holy grail. That's great. So along the pigs with didn't think it was the holy grail. <laughs> <laughs> So along about, with plan B also, Yahoo! I guess incorporated into the plan B, would you also consider the human factor? The fact that under stress, you may torque the bow a little bit. You may get a punchy release and, and of course, find a practice perfect, but we know you're in the stand. It's the heart rates up and you're gripping the bow and it's not perfect. Yeah. You haven't had 42 warm up shots with your fat friends. Right. 70 degrees right <laughs> everybody's good on the 3d range yeah, yeah. when it, when you get the time to twist your peep i don't like peep sights because they <laughs> cause trouble but you'll see people hunting and the first thing they do is twist their peep and then shoot i'm like oh boy that's gonna fail on you one of these days but um you don't you, when you go on a week-long hunt I, I don't shoot that much you go on a backpack hunt for elk you're not shooting mm -hmm. you're just backpacking and praying to god an elk walks in front of you mm -hmm. right so there isn't all this warm up time. So that's why you need to spend all your time at your house getting those arrows to be as behave as well as they possibly can. I mean, you have hours and hours and hours of prep and nobody tunes their arrows. 
Yeah. Come on, man. Do, don't get your reps trying to fix your form with arrows that are terrible. Get yeah. the arrows right and your form doesn't have to be as right. And to your point, and then if you make a human arrow and pull the arrow four inches, it still can go through whatever's there. Right. Um, arrows can do amazing things if they're set up right and have good broadheads on them. I don't care what anybody says. I've done it. I've got hundreds of pictures of broken bones. Aaron Warbritton at the hunting public this year. I've got the video. I'm going to put it up here a couple of months. He sent me the, the clips of him cleaning the deer. He shoots a deer. It's a big Midwest whitetail. Probably twice the size of anything I've ever seen on the hook. Five or six years old. Big squared up deer. Big 10 point. And he shoots that deer 14 yards on the ground or something. It hits a stick on the way there. It goes, it hit the ball joint of the shoulder. Hmm. It cut the ball joint in half like a lemon. Wow. And hit the other shoulder blade. He sent me the video about 10 minutes after he shot it. And he was pretty disturbed because he used to shoot video for Midwest whitetail and stuff. He's seen hundreds of deer killed with a bow and arrow, not to mention their own you know, uh, work that they're doing. And, um, he said, man, everybody's saying it's a one lunger. I said, how much arrow you got left? Cause it went in and stopped, but the arrow was solid in the animal. It didn't, wasn't doing this, right. The deer jumped and the arrow went with it. So I knew it was in, right. Mm -hmm. He said, I got 12 or 14 inches of arrow left. He said, they're 65 yards away. Go get him. There will be no blood trail. Mm -hmm. The shaft's in the hole and it's through the thickest muscle I bet that shoulder meat was that wide, yeah. right? That's a big deer. Mm -hmm. So it just can't get out because the shoulder's going to be moving. There's a hole there and the shoulder's going like this, right? So it ain't going to bleed. And he said, well, we're calling a dog because everybody else thinks it's a one longer blah, blah, blah. So that's fine. It was 75 or 65 or 70 yards downhill. Yeah. They did the right thing. Based on hundreds of seeing what happened, he got a dog. The dog literally, you see the dog like this and run down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. That's awesome. But that was a plan B hit. 650 single bevel. He's a pretty meticulous tuner. He bear shafts and all that. And he also shot completely through a bull elk this year, shooting frontal. It exited in the guts, and they'll they're gonna put that up in the fall, I think, this year. But um that's that's a plan B deal. Mm -hmm. That's a big animal, 15 yeah. yards, right? Hit a stick, redirected, still broke that ball joint. I mean, it is cut in half. It's not chipped or chunked or skipped off. It's split right down the middle. Hmm. It's awesome. And any other arrow system may have been a bonk. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> so really quick, your what we'll do is at the end of this video too, uh, actually, you know what, we'll just link it down below your Instagram because you have been posting some really good shots of people who are shooting low weight. Yep low poundage and still getting pass throughs and they're shooting adult yep. arrows and that includes females. And so that's, that's something I want to make sure we link, send people to your Instagram account to check that out. That's just testimonials are awesome. Yeah. The, the low poundage people really, really benefit. And the, the, the high poundage people should, should watch those and say, wow, because it, it scales up V squared though. <laughs> I'm going to watch out for that. But um, the really low poundage people shooting, single bevels and 550 or 600 grains are just torching stuff. They're breaking shoulders. They're getting pass throughs. They're killing deer going 40 yards and kids and ladies and Rob Nielsen's wife, Rhonda. Um, he's the president of the Ashby Bow Hunting Foundation. His wife is shoots, she has 24 inch draw and she shoots 43 pound Matthew something. Okay. She shoots a 575 grain arrow going at 24, 20, six percent it's a unicorn arrow mm -hmm. it's a super short high four to center and uh angle and flex on impact is that long right and she shoots um she thinks deer are kind of annoying like she just shoots through those she's like yeah whatever just kill deer that's boring <laughs> big hog she thinks her you know moderately challenging mm -hmm. she's taking sable all the big stuff in africa but the most impressive thing she's shot she's shot multiple bull nail guy and that's an antelope in Texas that they cut loose and tried to uh, domesticate. And, they, and, they, and the nail guy thought the fences were funny and just knocked them over and took off. That was about 40 <laughs> years ago. They're everywhere in South Texas. Oh, They're about 
I'm six feet tall. They're about shoulder high on me tall. Huh. They're five or 600 pounds. Wow. They look like a horse with a little butt. And they got this crazy looking head and a, and a big one has horns that long. Huh. And they suck up 300 wind mags like they think they're funny and they run off. Wow. She shot completely through two of them into the dirt. Impressive. She you killed one forty on a meal guy, don't you? They're vital. You do, yeah. yeah. Right. They're they're like all the they're like all the uh, Asian and African species. They're they carry their their gear their gear forward, but the vital V on that thing is probably that big. Mm. I mean, we're talking a basketball sized hole in the in front of the crease under the shoulder blade. I mean, it's, it's a big animal, right? And then there's multiple people they've been hunting with, and guys shooting seventy five pounds, and literally one guy had his arrow bounce off one. <laughs> wow and she just like well she's like the school teacher she's like five one she's like well i got another nail guy it's really great i love shooting nail guy you know she's so awesome bring you some cookies oh, i got a nail guy woohoo she shot six or seven of them oh funny she shot one at 40 and buried it to the fletch i think it went 100 yards and the first one she ever shot she didn't understand what quarter and away was it was the first nail guy she'd ever shot she thought she thought quarter and two was quarter and away Mm. Huh. So she just went ahead and pounded it right in there and just <laughs> killed one there in the hound. Hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. Wow. Good stuff. So, so Troy, tell us what, what do you hunt? What do you do in the outdoors? Kind of fill in the viewers here. I know I've heard you say in the past that deer don't do it for you. So yep. let us know what you do hunt and why. So I killed a, a book deer in 2008 and I lost it. I mean, I lost, I, I just don't care. I killed the deer and I don't care to shoot a deer. And at correspondingly, my, my boys got old enough to start gun hunting. So I've got a 223 in the safe over here that's got 38 names on it. So everybody who shoots their first animal with that gun, I, write, I literally write their name with a ballpoint pen on there. I'm wow. getting ready to have to flip the stock and start writing on the other side. <laughs> so I've killed a lot of deer <laughs> and I've cleaned a ton of deer. Yeah, I just don't like to shoot them myself. So I've been messing around out west. I'm the worst elk hunter ever. <laughs> if you if you hear that I draw, and you draw the same unit, turn your tag in. <laughs> like don't go there because they're not going to be any elk. Uh -huh. They'll be like, I don't know what happened to elk. About two weeks ago, they just left. <laughs> well, yeah, I know that. I just got back from cows deer hunting out in Arizona. They they I don't like them very much. They're annoying, and uh, <laughs> they beat me. And um, I really enjoy shooting adult feral hogs. And then um, that's really where my channel began because I was not very successful on the big ones. Hmm. Hmm. Now, remember, this is timered feeders that go off every day at the same time. The distance is known and I'm way better at 15 than I am at 20, so they're close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they come in, when a big boar hog comes into a deer feeder, which I get about five shots at real big adults every year. It isn't like every time. A bunch of zoomers come in, little turds and, you know, little rockets running around. I don't even mess with them anymore. But um, um, I was 50% at one time. Hmm. Wow. Known distance. Yeah. Wait for the sh When a big one comes in, he's convinced he's not dying. Mm -hmm. He's checked the wind, done his thing, and get a big adult in there. And so you can just wait. And they quartered away, just draw and wait till they're quarter and walk. And it, I was 50% at one time. Hmm. Recovery rate. That recovery. Yeah. I was hitting them and I was getting half an arrow in them. Hmm. And that, that was the beginning of me. The only other book of literature out there other than what I was getting from the shop was, is Ed's study. Is that and really what broke. kind of turned things for you was finding Dr. Ed? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I was, I'm a pretty logical person. And it wasn't what I was doing wasn't working. Yeah. I own guns. Mm -hmm. right? Is the 223 can shoot the biggest big right there. You can shoot them varmint tips or whatever. It doesn't matter. Headshots, they just go down, right? Mm -hmm. So I have I have guns and lead is very effective. Yeah. I didn't want to do it that way. I shot a bunch of them that way, just calling and stuff. But I just said, well, I have nothing to lose if I already suck this bad. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't suck more, right? If it doesn't work, I'll just go do what I did before mm -hmm. and keep praying to God I could find one. And the, there was never blood trails. 
we would, we would stumble up on a dead one or you'd hit them perfect and they would spray, you know, and it would just be death, right? Mechanicals, fixed blades, um, all that stuff. And I just wandered off by myself. I was 28, 15, 16. The last pig I shot with a mechanical weighed 230 pounds and I shot it with a schwacker at 17 yards with a 410 grain arrow and it literally bounced off. Wow. And it, it stuck in him for about a foot and then it flew out of his side. Mm -hmm. And I said, what the heck? And I literally just <laughs> snapped that thing off. And <laughs> I was at that time messing around with the heavy stuff and I just wasn't convinced. I mean, the trajectory is different. They look really slow. You know, they look terrible in the air when you're used to shooting and you can't see the arrow in flight. Right. You shoot, you hit and it hits the target. You're like, that's fast. That's what's supposed to work. But I went back and said, I already had a 670 grain arrow teed up with a grizzly broadhead, exactly like Ed said. The only thing I didn't do was narrow it down. He shot him at an inch wide. I just left it standard. 190 grain grizzly, 670 grains. Two weeks later, that same pig came out. He didn't make it. And I never looked back. Hmm. I shot him in the same feeder, in the same situation. And the arrow went all the way to the fletch. And I looked out the window of the, of the, of the uh, tent and I saw dust. And I went over there and there he was, 60 yards. And I said, okay, yeah, I'm not going back. And I'm, I'm, we're real close to 100% now. Hmm. Now it's, here's, here's the kicker, right? Hmm. This is the goal. I'm going to start talking about this on the channel more. <clears throat> you want your arrow tune and your arrow system to be so reliable that it's you. Yep. And that's not something people talk about. If you pull the shot and the deer jumps really hard and you hit it high and the deer has a boat and they get away with it, that's okay. It's going to happen. It happens with guns. It happens with everything. It's part of the game. The crocodile doesn't always win and the lion doesn't always get the impala, right? It is what it is. But if, if there's a certain percentage of pretty good hits and then long, long tracking jobs and digging around and calling your friends and getting a dog, yeah. I want that to go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our sport won't make it. Right. Yeah. If they, I mean, publish, I... the real, if they publish real recovery rates, yeah, you don't, oh, even talk, you don't even want to talk about it. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. I've I've read where people have said it's 25-30%, and that that may be accurate. And we've had that conversation, um, you know, with the recovery rate and with taking all the variables that we can out, removing all the variables out. So that if something happens, we know it was us. We put a bad shot on, we punched a trigger, whatever it was, things that we can work on, but without a properly tuned bow and arrow and everything else, good equipment that's reliable, man, you're, you're in the hole already before you even start. That's right. And the more I do this, the more it goes back to, you know, bullets and stuff. These people, there's a lot of people coming up with all fancy stuff, but that old partition will do it. I'm sorry, that bullet just kind of expands and does this job and shoots pretty straight. Yeah. And it doesn't fail. You pull the shot on an elk, it's gonna run away. So you, you know, something gets crazy, you hit something in the air with a with a bullet, it is what it is. You're shooting too far because you think you can and you can't, and you wing one in the leg, got it. And I want my arrow to be the nozzle partition or a full metal jacket, bullet <clears throat> every time. Yeah. And um that's what's happened. The, the reason why I say we're almost 100% is because um, I let my nephews and stuff hunt with me and they don't have any money. So they shoot whatever I give them. <laughs> they don't know they're shooting $30 broadheads, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's when I know it's them. Mm. Nerves are up, freaking out. They call me on the phone and they can't talk. I said, look, I was killing it. You know, they're just freaking out and we'll have some long nights that way. But I got the arrow in my hand, <laughs> right? It didn't leave with the pig. Yeah. The arrow's there. It did its job. Good stuff. If it stops, it didn't do its job, right? right? If it's Now, let me, let me put a caveat on that. My goal now is to break the offside shoulder on everything I shoot if I'm shooting quarter and away. I'm aiming at the bones on the other side. Mm -hmm. The opposite chest wall is bent like this. And when your broadhead goes through, it does that. It tends to catch. 
And then plus, if you hit the humorous or something, it's going to really, it's already hit, slowed down some, and then it hits the chest wall going like this, and then hits a humorous bone on the outside. It may catch. Mm-hmm. But I usually get an exit hole, and they run off. One, this one ain't working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I see that one not working, you know you're low, and you know you're in the chest mm-hmm. when you see the old flapper. Yep. And that's my goal every time now. I really want them to, just, I just want to anchor them, but it's, it's a different, it's a different planet when you know your system's not going to fail mm-hmm. and you have a lot more confidence when you're trucking around in the field. Absolutely. Yeah. So in, in closing, I mean, if there's nothing else you want to add, anything else you want to ask or. I don't think so. Where does uh, Steve live? We, we know some people that were originally from Northern Indiana here who, or they were from Texas, came here and went back, correct? Oh, yeah. yeah he's Possibly an opportunity to hunt some hogs on his property down there. So, uh, where is it? He's in Fort Worth. All right. Call me if I come up and see you guys. Yeah, it'd be a good time if we ever do that. We've talked about it within the next couple of years doing kind of a family hunt. My four boys or three boys, my son in law, I call Mike my boy. Uh, going on a, a hunt here in the next couple of years. And that may be one, the nice part about it is would be the cost, wouldn't be expensive. So we could all go have a great time and and uh, see what this hog shooting is all about. It's super fun. So here's your, here's the tip of the day. If you're going to travel for pigs, um, if you're going to hunt pigs or travel for pigs, you need to look at the moon chart and you need to come between the dark of the moon and the full moon. Okay. There's a 10 day period there. Mm-hmm. And the magic juice is two days after the dark and to two days before the full. Hmm. Just get on the internet, pick your month. Don't come any other time. Interesting. Got it. They love that freaking moon. Yeah. When it comes up in the daytime. So what happens there is the dark of the moon is when it's up all day. Most people don't know this. I think it comes up at night every day. Mm-hmm. Well, you can read books and stuff. It's pretty straightforward. 52 minutes later every day, whatever. So the dark of the moon is the moon's up all day. And then slowly you start to see the moon rising during the day and setting. And it's and when it comes up, they'll come out. Hmm. So don't come on any other moon phase and do not hunt the full moon on those things, unless you're going to do nocturnal stuff. But I've not had very good luck hunting the full full moon that's a whole wives tale it's a bunch of garbage hmm. I've, I've looked at my trail cameras and because i don't trail camera deer i trail camera pigs <laughs> i don't really yeah. care about the deer so i don't really look at them but right now i put all my cameras up looking for a big one and you can literally see watch the moon phase and then all of a sudden when that dark that dark moon starts to flip going into the full they'll be there in the daytime just over and over. Hmm. Got it. Got it. And I would come, uh, I'd come February, March, April, May. Hmm. Summer's great, but you'll melt. Well, no, Indiana's hot. You'll be fine. Yeah, it is in the summer. We yeah, if y'all clean. have AC and stuff, you'll be fine. Um, the, 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 they get shot up pretty good in October, November, December. We have a pretty long deer season. And every idiot with a gun's blasting away at them. Hmm. So they're pretty shy until about March. Gotcha. And then they get dumb. Yeah. Good. And we like dumb. That's my favorite. <laughs> dumb pigs is my favorite. I like dumb fish better, but uh-huh. I don't find many of those anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to catch a 10 pound bass right now. <laughs> so there won't be any videos coming up in February. <laughs> it's, all, it's the juice time in Texas. It's this is the time to catch a great big one. Uh huh. Oh. Stuff. So anything to anything in closing, Nick? Any questions or anything? I think we're all good. Um, for viewers, they can find the Ashby study at what URL? It's Ashby. So Ashby, Ashby bowhunting.org. Okay. Got it. Or just just type Ashby bowhunting into your whatever browser and you'll find us. I mean it's there's it's pretty, you know, pretty common. I mean, it's pretty unique. Yeah, right. There are five of them, right? Sure, sure. And then you can find me. All you have to do is type into your browser, the ranch fair, and you'll see some picture like this or like that or <laughs> that or something. It's not hard. That was a stroke of genius. I, the ranch fair name came from uh, the, our ranch. I'm the ranch manager. 
So I got to fix all the plumbing breaks and scooter breaks and tractors go down and fences and out of there. Blah, blah, blah. Could you tell me where the deer comes out with 10 points at four o'clock in the afternoon so I can make dinner and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and um, I started calling myself the rancher about 10 years ago. Mm. I just said, hey, call the ranch fair. I'll come down there and fix all your problems. You know, get the bees out the blinds and all that. Can do it yourself. Get some spray and spray it in there and go back in there, but whatever. And um, when I started the channel, I said, hmm, I wonder if that'll work. So I typed it into Google and nothing came up. Mm. So I'm no marketing person or genius at this, but it's pretty straightforward. If nothing comes up, the way the algorithms work, you're either unique enough that your name gets out or you're unique enough in your name that nobody's going to duplicate it. And there's nobody in bow hunting that's going to go ranch dash fairy. There's no way. Right. It's not very manly, yeah. you know? <laughs> Tough guys and all that. Got to have extreme bow hunter 9600 yard shots only dot com. <laughs> Got it. So that turned out to be quite a stroke of genius. And so it's been fun. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, we appreciate your time, really do. And the information too, when I first reached out to you, I want to make sure people understand this. I didn't ask for you to come on. I was simply thanking you for, first of all, sharing the information, holding your ground against uh, detractors and people who want to <laughs> blast you. Yeah. You know, we're the same way. We're principled. If we believe in it, we don't care who says otherwise. That's and right. so that, you know, I, I do appreciate that. And that's what I told you. And then you reached out and said, if you ever want to collab, let's do it. And so that was just a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, very cool. We appreciate the time. We really do any information, the knowledge. Well, thanks for having me on. I, I'm really trying to help the bow hunting world succeed. Yeah. And you know, all the people can rattle all they want at me. It's they're not right. It's irrelevant. It's it's completely irrelevant. Yeah. The the company line is not the most efficient arrow system to keep bow hunting on this earth and not have us run out of the freaking woods. I'm right. sorry. That's yeah. just a fact. So they can, I have my own experience from a long time of doing this. I've done a lot of crazy stuff with the pigs that I don't put on um, my videos that don't work. And I put the stuff that does and people, I want to go there for a second. So I'll give you an example of what doesn't work. So there's no laws on pigs. There's no, re the, the law does not address that whether you have to clean them, hmm. keep them or whatever. <clears throat> so I had gone over 650, gone single belt and started just breaking stuff, intentionally shooting quartering in and shearing humeruses off and just killing stuff dead in a hammer. Well, you have to do a test against your test. So I went back down and wait to 550 or 525, put on a double bevel, and I shot some, I shot three pigs that were under 125 pounds at 15 yards or so, quartering in on the ground. My recovery rate was zero. Mm. I stopped doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it wasn't working. Right. And that's a that's a shot in and of itself. The quartering in shots are really common shot. So mm. just a little aside there, I do check myself <laughs> yeah, okay. occasionally. I'm not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not fair to them, right? Yeah. Once again, I 30 out six in the head. Yeah, pretty easy to shoot. And you go over there and pick them up. Pretty straightforward. So thank you all for your time. I appreciate you having me on, helping spread the message and uh, help them our, you know, our game, help us stay in the woods. Yeah. That's the goal, Absolutely. man. Yeah, we can fight all you want, get on the message boards and rattle and make fun of people and chew everybody's butt and tell, say people, I'm crazy. I really want this sport to stay. Yeah. Even though I don't care about deer. Right. You know, <laughs> everybody's got their shortfalls. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. I, I care that you do. I care that you're killing deer, right? That's, yeah, that's yeah. And, and that's the important thing, killing them. So that's right. All right, y'all have a great yeah. day. All right, Troy. Thank you very much. Take yes, care. sir.